University of Maryland Global Campus has more than 20 years experience providing affordable online education to military service members and working adults. Offering low tuition, no-cost digital resources replacing most textbooks, scholarships for those who qualify, and more. Learn more at umgc.edu slash podcast. It's the holidays, which usually means employing your surprise face. But winter-winning scratchers are loaded with $500 prizes, so there's always a surprise. Unlike the 27th snowflake ornament from Grandma. Play along with holiday scratchers from the Virginia Lottery at a retailer near you. For odds and more information, visit VALottery.com. Hey everyone, this is the Almost Rogue Podcast. Bringing to you mind-blowing interviews with guests from all over the world. So settle down, relax, and enjoy the show. Oh yeah, by the way, if you like the podcast, please support Elmo's World Podcast on Patreon. Your support is what helps the podcast improve more and more. Welcome to Elmo's World Podcast. This is Elmo and I'm back, baby. <laughs> hey guys, uh, the, the, I have my friend Brandon Duke here and he's an open theist. So I'm going to go get down to business and just ask him a lot of hard questions. And by the way, Brandon, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I, I'm new to the podcast, but I've really enjoyed uh, getting caught up. You've done interviews with some philosophers that I really respect, like uh RT Mullins, for example, I really enjoyed your interview with him and also one with uh, Jeffrey uh, Kapersky. I literally just got his book. So your podcast is right on point. Wow. Awesome. All right, Brandon. So tell me, man, what do you believe like, in? Like, can you tell me your background? At least? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a Protestant Christian. I grew up in a non-denominational church. I was actually a preacher's kid. My dad was the pastor for a long time. And, uh, I, it was a, an Adventist uh, type of, of organization. And so they had a, a strong teaching about the imminent, uh, the imminent return of Christ and uh, such a strong teaching. In fact, that uh, they're one of those that they would make false predictions, right? They would anticipate his return in the sixties or in the seventies or the eighties. And um, so I, I got a good dose uh, growing up of watching sincere people be sincerely wrong. And uh, I, uh, I spent my adult life working as a tech guy. I actually am an entrepreneur. I've got a small business where I do information technology work. And so in my spare time, um, I like to study philosophy and theology and history, um, you know, trying to not make those kinds of mistakes, right? Where we're, we want true beliefs and we don't want false beliefs. So, um, so I'm just an armchair philosopher, you know, a wannabe, and, uh, but I like very much the world of analytic theology where you bring your, your, you know, uh, your philosophical tools to bear on theological questions. And so, um, one of the things that that's led me to is to look really hard at the doctrine of God's sovereignty, um, the doctrine of his foreknowledge and, uh, you know, being a Christian, um, I, you know, I, I hold to like perfect being theology is a good way to, to try and examine God or examine our ideas about God. I mean, and, um, and so how do we square this, you know, this idea that God has perfect knowledge of, of all there is to know with the idea that, um, from my perspective that we need, uh, real, I would call, uh, full libertarian free will in order to have moral standing before him. And how do we how do we square those two things? So, uh, as you mentioned before, I I consider myself an open theist, and probably I have for, oh, I don't know, uh, five or ten years. I, I don't know that I could go back to the exact moment that I that I would hold that term. But my whole life, I've been taught that the Bible simply just asks us to obey God, and uh, and expects us to. And it was only as an adult that I ran into. Uh, full-fledged Calvinism, you know, five-point Calvinism, and uh, and then started learning about Augustine's view of free will and and um, 
and really found those abhorrent uh, <laughs> as much as sometimes people will, will find open theism to be deprecating God's, you know, power or his, uh, his wisdom. I find Calvinism to be deprecating his goodness. So, um, so yeah, I hold a view that some people are starting to call dynamic omniscience uh, instead of open theism. I think they're sort of trying to recoin the, the term to sound a little more uh, positive because uh, sometimes people will say that they think open theism sounds like uh, like God doesn't know the future, right? And that's obviously not what open theists think. Open theists think there there is no such future that's already out there uh, for God to know exhaustively, that that the idea is the future becomes real and anyone that's uh familiar with you know uh the philosophy of time will will recognize the idea of an a theory or presentism uh where all that's really real is the is the present and the past is is no longer real it's it's just stored informationally in the present and the the future is just contingencies and uh some of them may be very high or even even close to certain and god certainly knows those as that and there are other contingencies that God knows um, as contingencies, as very unlikely or very likely. And God then arranges his plans and responds to us as we as we act. So um, so I don't know if that's a fair if that's a fair description. I didn't really give you a history of how I came to that. I think I probably have always I've always held the view. I didn't even know there was an alternative really <laughs> until I got until I got older and I started running into into people that hold other views, Calvinism and Molinism, and even simple, simple foreknowledge. Probably as a young person, I was probably a, an Arminian, right? It was simple foreknowledge. And I, I didn't see where there were, that would represent, uh, where that might represent a problem for, for free will or, or moral standing. Let's talk about your experience as a Christian first. I want to get down to that. And then maybe, you know, let's go from like, let's fill, uh, funnel into from very philosophical, uh, emotional stuff and, you know, these uh, experiencing and then into the really analytic philosophy. So as a Christian, right, um, you do, you know, worship God, uh, love God, love Jesus Christ as your, and accept him as your Lord and Savior. But um, can you talk about what, when that happened for you and started? Oh, yeah. It's as long as I can remember. Apparently, uh, my parents talked about me at four years old giving sermons to the the nice old people that would sit around and <laughs> and indulge me, I guess, uh, like father, like son. Um, it's as long as I can remember uh believing in God and, 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 uh, and, and Jesus as his, uh, you know, unique Christ his his Messiah and our savior. And, um, so I don't have like a born again experience, like, like a lot of people have, right. Where they, they sort of had this, this key moment. It's been, it's been my entire life. And, um, but, but I also have seen a lot of heartache. Um, I've seen church splits, and I mean, you know, hundred a church organization the size of a hundred thousand people across the planet, um, split into dozens of little splinter groups, um, you know, and and uh, and and seen it from the inside, you know, from the perspective of people uh, that are involved in the 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 politics and that like the ugly part of church policy policy uh, or church politics. Pardon me. So. Um, so I, I've, I, I've got a healthy dose of skepticism, I would say, from that. Um, that's probably built into just me, it's my personality now. So I want to challenge um, my own views. I want to make sure that, that I'm not uh, believing things just because I inherited them. I want to make sure that, um, you know, that I'm, there's all these great verses uh, about seeking God, right? That that's our job um, in, in, in the Old Testament and the New um, you know, we're supposed to ask and seek and knock. And so I, I just feel like that's this kind of intellectual pursuit of God, in addition to our, you know, our trying to live according to his, his, his word, um, that this intellectual pursuit is, is an important way to worship him. And so, yeah, that's the basis for, for my, you know, my library of, of nerdy theology and philosophy books that, <laughs> that lead me to, to this. And, I've had some really important influences, you know, philosophers like William Lane Craig, um, whose apologetics I, I found really helpful, um, and and others that kind of introduced me. I didn't even know there was such a world, sort of in academia, of these this Christian philosophy world um, that I, I just really respect. And I, I think 
if there are Christians out there that aren't familiar with this, um, he's a great place to start and you can find his articles or his, uh, his, um, his published work that interacts with other philosophers. It led me to a philosopher named Dale Tuggy, uh, who has written extensively on open theism and on other questions like the Trinity, um, who's been really influential to me. And, um, and then they, I've just branched out from there, looking, looking into, into all these questions. I, I'm, I think analytic theology gives us a great way to examine our views and, and try to step outside of what can be sometimes just simple proof texting of, of, uh, you know, we just take our reading of the Bible and, uh, you know, we, we don't even sometimes know what our hermeneutical framework is. We don't know that we've got, you know, glasses on that we're seeing the, the text through the, the scriptures through. So if we can analyze those, um, those assumptions through the, through these other tools, then I, hopefully it gives us a chance at, at coming to, at coming to some right, <laughs> some true beliefs. At least that's, that's my hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, when it comes to your, let's say, you know, how you came about believing in Jesus Christ, it, it then I, from how, what I understood, you actually sort of, um, gradually believed in it you know, as a child being raised in it, but eventually you started to dive into more on the intellectual side of it, but you were always a Christian. You were always a believer, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. It's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you inherit it through, through, you know, <laughs> heredity basically, right. You're, you're by chance born a Christian. And then at some point, and for me, it was probably in my teens and, and early twenties. Um, it stops being something that, uh, that you're told and you just accept because you trust your teachers and your, you know, your family, people like that. Um, and it starts being something that you really own. And I went through a real, a real period of, of doubt. Um, I, I would probably call myself an agnostic because I, I didn't feel like I had the kind of basis to believe um, what I'd been taught that, um, that I had, you know, the basis to believe other things. It's, it's easy to say, yeah, I'm sitting in this chair. I have a pretty high level of confidence. It's actually true. Um, you know, and that I'm not a brain in a vat or something like that. But I just didn't have that same level of confidence in, in that there was a God. I mean, that's where I actually started um, my examination. And then any you know, work out from there, if, if you can establish there's a God, there's a creator of the universe, um, it gives you reason to look to see if he's revealed himself somehow, which leads you to look at, you know, you know re religions across the world at holy texts, and trying to examine them for, for trustworthiness. And then, you know, if you end up uh, finding the Bible to be a good source for that, then it, at least the Hebrew Bible, um, then that leads you to the New Testament and examining the Gospels. Um, you know, I, I've appreciated there's a there's a Christian scholar named Mike Lacona, Mike Lacona, who's done some great work on the um, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and you know those kinds of those kinds of things that that lead you to um, or that have led me to conclude that the resurrection account is real um and then once you're there uh then it's trying to make sure that you're following the right sort of flavor of that i mean we've got plenty of types of christianity to tr to choose from um you know roman catholics and eastern orthodox and calvinists and uh people from the radical wing of the protestant reformation all don't believe the same things so then we got to examine there and 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 keep kind of zeroing in on what we think is the truth so that's my that's my approach that's how i see the the challenge that we have as believers okay well you know when when you talk about like um all that we need like we need to know about the hermeneutics all these analytic philosophical uh, the and in, in theology you know it, it actually when it comes to if you ask me like this is the source as to why there are so many denominations in in christianity you know like <laughs> even within the catholic church you know they 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 themselves have the, their disagreements but of course they're united by uh, the vatican but you know when, when you go to the orthodox and the protestant they're like everybody thinks they're right and everybody thinks they have the proper methodology and hermeneutics in, in order to determine the, who has the right theology Okay, so I want to get down to theology first, and then maybe we could go on to the philosophical side, right? I, I want to address the theology first. So when it comes to theology, man, like, 
and you're an open theist, you know, what makes you different from everybody else? Like, what is the essence? Okay, so I would say that there are three sort of lines of evidence that lead me to open theism and that I think distinguish it from from other ways of thinking about God. So, um, so I think that there, depending from my perspective, in order for us to have moral standing, to be uh, to be morally judgeworthy, either praiseworthy or or worthy of condemnation, that that requires libertarian free will. Uh, and this is a, an intuition that um, I, I understand not everyone has. I understand there are people that that a, a compatibilist view um, to them seems to be acceptable, but but I, I can't imagine. Uh, any of us ever, uh, you know, condemning a rock for the direction that it fell downhill, um, because it lacks two way powers, it doesn't have the ability to, to choose left or right. And so if the rock, ro the boulder rolls downhill and smashes my car for me to come out and yell at the boulder, uh, doesn't seem to make much sense. Um, if someone pushed the boulder, that's, that's all another thing. Um, and the, w unfortunately, for me, I think Calvinism and other what I would call the deterministic systems, um, they they take persons, what people are uh, um, humans that should be seen as agents, and it turns them into these boulders that that God's rolling downhill. And um, you know the the typical defense is well, you know, uh, from a, a compatibilist is going to be to say, well, um, you know, you you are not compelled to do this, right? Um, you know, you freely do what that is, what, what you will. But the problem is what you will is it determined by God. And so uh, if God pushes the rock downhill and you say, well, you know, that rock didn't, uh, it didn't, uh, it, it freely rolled down the hill. Well, yeah, but that doesn't establish the rocks moral accountability for, for the, for the outcome. So I think that's, I think that's one point. It's, it's this idea of moral standing. I think um, as as someone who has studied, um, and <laughs> I guess we are all students of the philosophy of time, you know, any of us that have ever wondered, uh, you know, am I going to wake up in the morning, uh, is <laughs> to me is, is somebody that studied the philosophy of time, because they're, they're a presentist, they, they're looking at the future and saying, well, it seems like it's not, it's not predetermined. Um, but look, we live in a world right now where there are plenty of B theorists, people that are eternalists or into eternalism. And they, they think of uh, all of time as some kind of, you know, four dimensional block or the other ways that they'll talk about that, right? And, um, and if, if that future is sort of ontically there, if it's really out there that's um, in such a way, um, then it, it again, it seems like for, to, to me, to someone that holds to that A theory, to, to, um, to the dynamic emergence of, re of, of the present, um, that again, we don't have moral standing. We're, we're, we're to the same kind of fatalism again. And so then the question is, um, assuming that those two things are true, can we have a version of God that is still powerful, that's still omniscient, um, and, and be able to square that? And, and so I, as I see it, open theism is, is the solution to that, that what seems to a lot of people like a paradox, where God, how can God know the future and yet I'm still able to freely choose. I'm, I'm able to change that future. Um, and open theism solves the problem in a different way than say Calvinism or Molinism uh, or simple foreknowledge does. It says that the future exists in these, uh, these probabilities, these contingencies, and that God knows what those likelihoods are. And, um, and then he allows us to have some part in making that future or whichever future we choose real. So from a theological standpoint, to me, this is the basis for the entirety of like a meaningful life. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to overstate it, but to me, I, I, I've always said, I don't know how atheists uh, or why atheists get up in the morning. Um, I feel a little bit that way about, about non-open theists uh, and my atheist friends, you'll understand. I, uh, as a Christian, you know, I, I have quite the negative view of, um, of a, of a world that ends in, uh, you know, the heat death of the universe. Um, so, 
you know, I, I find, uh, sorry, almost cracking up at me. Hey, so you're <laughs> calling kind of everybody laughing. else that's not an open theist nihilist, basically. Because... <laughs> no, I, I'm saying, I think if I were to, to hold one of those views, if, if I thought it was the only true option, I think I would be. Uh, cheers to everyone who's not, who, who continues to, to live a moral life, but but I don't see I don't see the I don't see the point of, of living if there's not an actual moral development if there's not a if there's not a growing process that that we're uh, responsible for and that we're you know uh, that, that that we get to bring to bring about in partnership with with God of course. Um, Question though, um, I I interviewed uh, Dr. Ryan Mullins and that's pretty much what he holds too. You know, he he there has to be some sort of narrative that we humans actually take part in. You know, where our agency actually matters. So I I don't know is that what it takes it means to be an open theist to have this uh, under at least the this take on the philosophy of time. So as I understand it, Dr. Mullins is actually he's a Molinist and. Um, and he, he views as does like William Lane Craig's another pretty famous Molinist. Um, and I, as I understand it for those guys, it, it's the Molinism is the, is the better way to kind of bring together this, uh, a better solution to bring together these seemingly contradictory ideas of God's foreknowledge and our, our freedom. Um, but I, but I find Molinism highly troubling because, um, it may appear in the, in the, uh, when we zoom into one person's individual life, it, it certainly appears like libertarian freedom that they've got. Um, but because Molinism depends on a God looking before he creates at all of the possible worlds that he could create and then choosing one based on his knowledge of, um, of what the people would do, freely do in each of those worlds, it's still fatalism in my view. Because, uh, you know, I've used this analogy before. Imagine you don't do this, but imagine you, you put a baby in a maze, right? With like a bottle at the end of it. We're not going to do this to an actual baby, people. Um, but imagine you, you put a baby at the beginning of a maze with a bottle at the end. And you know that this baby only makes left-hand turns, right? This is the kind of knowledge that God has in Molinism. He knows every time Brandon sees a cheeseburger, he's going to eat it or some piece of more significant knowledge than that then whether or not the baby gets that bottle is not dependent on anything morally intrinsic to that baby. It's entirely dependent on which of the mazes God chooses to actualize. And so what's highly concerning to me is your ultimate, you know, soteriological fate, your, your destiny of, of salvation or not, um, is not now intrinsic to anything to you. It's, it's intrinsic to which of those worlds God chooses to actualize. Um, and so for me, I still think that we have the same, we have the same problem. And I'm not sure how Dr. Mullins responds to that. I've, I've, um, I actually wrote a, a letter after the death of my father to, uh, to Dr. Craig, who picked it up on his podcast actually and responded to it. And, um, and I didn't actually hear a satisfactory uh, response to that. Um, so I, I'd be interested to hear what other Molinists would, would say to that objection. I would assume it would be similar to what a Calvinist would say, well, you're freely choosing. So then, um, therefore it's, um, uh, you know, you're not being compelled to do something and therefore it's, it's appropriate for you to be morally judged. Um, but boy, I still think it suffers from the same problem where, you know, on, on the Calvinist account, it's whichever world God wills into existence with every detail is his will, every, horrible instances is, is God's specific will or is or veiled I forget all the different kinds of wills he's got on Calvinism but then on Molinism you have the same I think problem that whichever of the worlds that he chooses from his um from his billions upon billions of of options um you know that's that's the one that's going to damn or or save people and you know you might be saved in 99 percent of these worlds but Unfortunately, only the one, you know, the one that God chooses happens to be the one where you're, where you're damned. Um, so I, I just, uh, I, I think, and there's, uh, by the way, there are people that argue about this question of a trans world damnation. I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but, but where they'll argue that basically on any world that God could, 
um, that God could bring to be that some people are, are just always going to be lost. And man, um, unless everybody that's going to be lost is that way in every world, um, I don't see how that helps the problem. So yeah, I think the way that you look at time and the way that you think about um, how we have freedom, I just think it's fundamental to to the whole Christian life and, and not just to Christians. Like, I don't understand how any other religious view that holds to fatalism can hold up to like this, this moral standing problem. Okay. Let me just recap that. And then, you know, tell me if I uh, just clarify if I understood it right. Okay. You're saying like Calvin for Calvinists, you know, they believe that every, that God is sovereign and, and you know, providence is, is everything that controls all the outcomes. That means that every evil thing or every person that goes to hell was actually planned by God from the start, you know, and God intended all these evil things to happen. But all at the same time, man is still, of course, you know, morally accountable and that deserves to be judged because he did, he did uh, freely do it. But, you know, it's, I guess they sort of mold it in a compatibilistic way. And then for a Molinist like Dr. Craig, it, it's simply that God chooses the, the like from a multiverse, you know, of, of many versions of earth, God simply chooses the best possible one with the best possible outcome. And which means that, uh, that we did do all the, in all those worlds, we were free, but it's simply that God chose the, the one, the specifically the one that, that he wanted, uh, he liked the outcome the most. Right. But what you're saying as an open theist is like uh, the present is constantly emerging, which means that this present right now is actually the only like thing that is ontological thing existing right now. And the past is actually gone. Right. And we're just riding a, a wave that that only exists right now and there's no future and no past. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. From an ontological perspective. Yep. Okay. Well, let me uh, dive down into that. Okay. I can understand you roasting all everybody else, mom, but <laughs> I can see a lot of problems with open theism. You sure. know, just from sure. the from just from the surface, I can say like, how can God be omniscient in an open theist uh, definition? Let me ask you that. Let's say, like, let me ask you, how do you define omniscience, just to be more specific, you know? And then yeah. how do you, how can you say that God is omniscient? Gotcha. So for me, omniscience is just knowing everything there is to know. Um, there is to know. Yeah. Okay. It's knowing everything that there is to know. All true facts, all true things, all, um, uh, all, uh, all probabilities, all, um, all propositional facts. It's to know everything that there is to know. So then the question for me is what things are there to know? Um, right? So once you remove the, the ontological reality of the future, um, then there, there is no, what there, what's left are to be able for God to be able to, um, I mean, obviously he knows everything that has been and everything that exists with perfect knowledge. Um, and so he can forecast to an amazing degree. Um, so there's, there's that element. Um, and, and, um, oh, forgive me, my phone just went off. Sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, you know, so God knows what there is to know. And really we all say the same thing. The, the question is, what is there to know? And I mean, uh, um, you know, does God know what it's like, uh, to feel, uh, to, to do evil and, and willfully do it. Um, he probably, he probably knows what he knows. Uh, he can see that from a third person perspective, right? But he doesn't know it from a first person perspective. So, you know, to say that there are things that God can't know, um, because they're either logical contradictions, you know, you know, because we, we say this about God's power too, right? God can't draw a square circle. He can't make married bachelors. He can't force someone to freely do something. Um, so there are plenty of these limitations to the omnis um, that, that people don't find objectionable. So I, I think there's just, there is a need, I, I think, for people to um, 
uh, let me rephrase that. People have a tendency to look at prophetic statements in the Bible um, and say the only way to understand this is if God knows the future with certainty. And I, this is the number one objection I hear to open theism, which is how do you know th that, that God's going to bring about the right ending to things? How do we know things are going to work out? Um, and my, my point is God's bringing about his ends is not about him scripting or, or, or writing it. I mean, uh, um, you could certainly have that. You could have an author that scripts the entire book um, and gets the beginning, middle, and end that, that he wants, right? But in that case, he's the only agent. It's not in any way a relational situation. If, on the other hand, you have someone who is, who's written a script, they have a, an idea in their mind, but now they bring actors onto the stage who are going to participate. They're going to actually be a part of developing this, this story. Now you have this relationship between, between man and God. Um, and God uses other ways. He's got his power, right, that he can use to bring things to be. If God says, I'm going to annihilate the world tomorrow, he can just do that. He doesn't have to have foreknowledge of anything. He can just will that he's going to do it tomorrow, and he could do that. Um, and, you know, so there are prophecies in the, in the Bible that we see that are of that nature where he can, he can just cause it to be the case. He can just follow through with his word. We see lots of conditional prophecies where it's an if-then statement. If you don't uh, repent, then I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But Nineveh does repent, and um, and so he he relents from doing so to, you know, to Jonah's chagrin. Um, so I, I think that the big objections to open theism is it makes people think that the world is out of control, that somehow God is is too small. In fact, I think there's a book called that their God is too small, I believe in criticism of open theism. And, um, and I just think there are answers to this and that, that a, a, a truly powerful and wise and good God doesn't have to, he doesn't have to write the whole script in order to get the ending he wants. He can, he can bring it about through, through his wisdom. I mean, there's a famous, uh, forgive me if I'm, if I'm going too long on this, but there's a famous analogy that there's an open theist named Greg Boyd. And he, he describes God as the ultimate chess player. That if you know if God is is perfectly wise and and uh, and and is is intelligent, and capable as as we want to say, how many games of chess could he have going? And could he win every last one of them? And not by knowing every move that you'd make, he can respond perfectly to every move in response. He he doesn't have to know uh, know every tick uh, that you know and every uh, every talk of 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 your mind. Um, he does know that. But he, he doesn't have to know that he doesn't have to cheat. He could just straight beat you. Um, so there's this idea in open theism that God is, is in the relationship with us, that that's important, and that he's opening the world and opening the future to relationship with us. There's a, there's a book that I, I just ran into that I, I really appreciate called The God Who Trusts. And it's this idea that to have authentic relationship, there has to be an element of, of trust. You have to extend trust. And then you have to be shown to be worthy of that trust, to be trustworthy. And, um, and I see that as exactly the, the, the story of the Bible. In fact, the word, uh, the word for faith that we all use, that we, you know, in the English and our New Testaments, really, we, we should think of it as trust. And God is looking to see who, who is trustworthy, who he can, I mean, if, if we think that the end goal is some kind of life with God, um, I'd have to ask people on what account of, um, of salvation do we qualify to be with God in the future? It, it's to me, it's gotta be based on our trustworthiness because, uh, the only alternative is what William Lane Craig, I've heard him say, which is why is there no sin in the kingdom? Why is there no sin in the, in the future when, when all is in all? And he says, because God will remove our ability to sin to which I throw up my hands and say, then what are we doing? uh what well, <laughs> with due respect to dr craig um what's what's the point of all of this struggling in this and this striving and this this seeking of obedience where, where god says uh, you know to the gr the great compliment to abraham is now i know right now i know that um that you'll obey me and and um and you won't even withhold even this son so um for me there's um, and there's a ton of great open theist, theist literature out there. I mean, there's a, the original book, The Openness of God, 
it was a group project by a group of five. There's the God who risks, um, which I would strongly recommend. There's, there's a ton of great material out here that, and I don't know how much of Christianity has actually come in contact with it. Um, and, um, and I hope, I hope people will, even if it sounds heretical and scary at first, I think ultimately it's in, it's intuitive. If anything, the risk I think for open theism is that it's too common sense to be able to like, ah, God's too mysterious and, and kind of otherly for us for, for this kind of common sense. Uh, what, I mean, as parents, this is how we interact with our children. That's how we teach them, right? We have to extend them opportunities to, to fail and then to repent. And, um, you know, I think for some people that seems too, I don't know, too human to be, to be uh, God's approach, but I don't know. We're in God's image. Why wouldn't that be? I mean, why wouldn't this be, if it's true that you can't logically force someone to freely do something, then what's left? You, God has to give us the space to choose to love him freely. And I think that's what he's doing. This is very interesting. And I, 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 now I, I actually learned something today, which is good. <laughs> yeah. I've been, <laughs> well, well, I don't want to, I, hopefully I'm not, I don't want to avoid any of your challenges because, because I'm aware of it. Look, I, one of my favorite things are these four and five views books, you know, where they'll pull together, you know, people that write, write on these different subjects. And I, I don't want to, um, you know, it's so easy to, to, to straw man the, the other views. So I certainly don't want to do that. So feel free to push back if, if there, are, if there are things that I say that where I'm, I don't want to be uncharitable, nor do I want to, um, uh, not really respond. Does if if God knows what all, all that there is to know, does God know all that He can possibly? Mm. Well, I, I'm trying to think about what the diff, the distinction between that would be. All that He, all that there is to know, versus all that you could possibly can know. Poss I'm trying to, th to think of what the difference between those two sets of facts. Would be. Let's say, like for example, like um you know everything that that there is you know is this within you know like in this monad but everything that could possibly know is all the possible world worlds that you know like a or b you know all the the mapping and the webbing yeah so a lot of a lot of open theists will say absolutely god can god can foresee all of the potential uh the potential futures that are out there right so he says today the the present exists bam it's it's real um, and the, you know, some people use the analogy of like, you know, the, the forking sort of, uh, futures, right. Like a tree of futures out there. Um, and that what happens is as events occur, you know, some of the limbs fall off to the side as they they didn't get actualized. So yeah, open theists are going to say, God can anticipate all of those, all of those limbs, if you will, all those branches that lead out away to us in the future. Um, and he knows even which of those are more likely or less likely at any given time. So he can plan based based on that, but that for most of those values, or at least some of those values, the certainty is not one is not one. It's not one hundred percent because there are other agents. You know, right now on the planet Earth, there's seven billion or so that are constantly making decisions that are influencing which of those those futures comes comes to reality. So in a way, you're saying that. Um... It's sort of, I, I, I think this is, this reminded me of a movie. Uh, I watched this in Matrix, The Matrix, mm. you know, where, where the one, you know, Neo mm -hmm. is, 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 a per, is, is the only one where the, the game maker ha cannot predict his, uh, Neo's actions. Yeah. You know, he's, uh, yep. so oh. this is sort of the, he's sort of the blind spot to it. Are you saying that every human being, is the blind spot to God's omniscience. I know exactly the scene you're talking about, right? Where he's sitting in there with the architect, the, the beard, white yeah, beard. Yeah, yeah, the architect. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the, yeah, in that, in that scenario, the architect's expecting one behavior and then Neo surprises him, right? He says, in yeah. this case, it's his love for Trinity. He saves gonna... Trinity, yeah. That's right, that's right. So, so in the sense that God is like that architect in the sense that, He's certainly not controlling Neo, right? Neo's going to be able to freely make his own decisions. But I think God is going to be greater than that architect because um, God, the architect is, is like surprised, right? He's like shocked by what Neo does. Well, if you're God and you are watching Neo get closer and closer to this decision, 
right? You've, you've watched every moment of Neo's life and every other life that's happened, all every molecule, molecule in the universe you're aware of. By the time Neo gets closer and closer to that, think about how much more certain God is going to be about what kind of decision Neo is going to make, right? I mean, the split second before he does it, boy, it's really high. The likelihood that, that God knows what, what he's going to do is really high. Now, Neo could still go, he could still zag, right? He could choose option B. Um, but, you know, God knows what the, what the likelihood of that is. So, um, so we're just trying to include one little element of, um, of freedom. And some open theists hold to very little freedom. They say we, most of the moves that we make are determined, kind of like billiard balls, right? Because we are material, we have habits, right? But that there still has to be that, that shred of, for, for them, some opportunity to do to do otherwise even if it's tiny even if it's minuscule that retains that moral accountability and um and i i, I like to think of it even more more broadly than that like meaning a, a stronger kind of freedom than that but um but yeah I, I think that's an interesting analogy except i think god is is he has more information than the, the architect in that movie has so i can in your in your worldview god is actually like a, a player or like a real actual agent that who who is an who's uh who also makes like decision within time right and that's really Absolutely. interesting so mm. that's another thing that's worth me that's another thing worth me saying is is um tip for people that um, have studied Aquinas. If anybody can explain Aquinas to me, uh, please do, because uh, I'm not sure anybody's ever really understood Aquinas and, and what it means for God to be pure actuality and for him to be outside of time and yet interacting with with all points of time. I, I don't know how to make sense of that. Um, I do know what it means for God to do this and that and bring one plague and then another and then another and another in response to human human choices. Um, and that, that seems to be a real relationship. Um, and that's what I, I see throughout the Bible. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to reject, you know, the idea that God is outside of time. Um, I don't know what impassibility I look, there's, there's an entire classical theism view, which really is what I guess I'm pushing back at. Um, impassibility, um, well, I, I could probably go through the whole list of, of classical theism attributes that are given to God. I mean, obviously, I don't think God's character changes, but like, what a terrible, in my view, what a terrible view of God that he doesn't know it's now, let's say, 818. Okay, now it's 819. Um, it seems to me a, a truly omniscient and great God knows what time it is. And um, and I don't know how to, how a timeless God or, or an impossible God um can 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 know that and um so the, you know there's there is this big pushback yeah so i just think god needs to be in time um and that basically the whole kind of all the categories of of attributes that classical theism gives to god i, I think they need to be challenged um both for their their re being reasonable philosophically and whether they square with our bibles so so i think open theism offers good answers to those yeah, that's a, and then this open theist, theism stuff, man. I might actually consider it. You know, I'm a very open minded person. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I actually asked all my friend, uh, friends on Facebook about this. You know, um, some of them didn't, I guess, comment because, let, let's say, uh, if, our, if, our, if they were atheists, they probably didn't know anything about open theism. But there were some that actually attempted to answer this, and maybe you could uh, respond to them. You know, and I, you, I think you oh, commented there a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I'll be yeah. reading those interactions, you know, and I'll analyze oh, who's right. <laughs> okay. Um, we have here. <laughs> Sounds good. From Brian Irvin. So uh, he says, I'm not fully up to speed on it. But as an alternative to so-called reformed theology, yes, open theism, that's what he's referring to, is infinitely better. Better than all other kinds of theism. I haven't thought of it. I haven't thought it through enough to say. So what, how would you respond to this? Well, I, I agree with, with Brian that the, the whole like reformed package, uh, which I would also call Augustinian Calvinism, um, to try and place it in its historical context. Um, 
I, I think the reformed view is out of step with all the other versions of Christianity. Um, although it has things in common with other kinds of theism, partially because Augustine came out of, uh, he spent <laughs> at least a decade or two as a Manichaean uh, before he converted to Christianity. And there's now a significant amount of uh, evidence, I think, um, to say that he, he brought those ideas with him. And, and so some of what he, what became Calvinism um, that, that Calvin pulled from Augustine looks very much like the Gnostic and, and Manichaean religions of that time, you know, of the third and fourth century, um, which look an awful lot like Stoic philosophy. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's fair for Brian to say, you know, we, the, the book's still open on what the best kind of theism total is. But for Christians, I, 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 think, he's, I think he's fair to criticize Reformed theology. I, I, I find a lot of fault with it, too. Yeah, all right. And the next um, comment is from my bro, Jan, John Handy. And he says, oh, okay, uh, I believe conditional election, unlimited atonement, coupled with Molinism, best accounts for divine goodness divine sovereignty, divine omniscience, human freedom, and the dynamic between God and created persons. Because you and I have a say in salvation while God knows of every iteration of every possible world, while having no causal determination. Our future actions are logically prior to God's knowledge. And next paragraph, foundationally, Divine simplicity offers the most robust justification for divine goodness, as well as making things like natures and essences intelligible, while also creating a meaningful distinction between the necessary and contingent. And uh, two people reacted here. So there, he talks about two things, man, I think. And, right on, John. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you say about it, bro? Yeah, sorry. I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I think he makes some good points. I, I think what he describes, his description of Molinism is, is is good as, as the way Molinists would see it. I too agree. We need conditional action, unlimited atonement. Um, we need to reject, in my view, all five points of Calvinism. Um, as to whether the logic, like our future actions being logically prior to God's knowledge, protects our freedom, I don't. I don't think that solves it. That that's a famous uh, argument from Molinists that they say, well, look. Um, be, just because our actions, um, just because God's knowledge is is uh, temporally prior, as long as His knowledge isn't logically prior to our actions, then our free will is is assured. And uh, I just listened here recently to a, a lecture by uh, I mentioned before Dr. Dale Tuggy, who's a philosopher um, in the analytic school, and he argues that um, the problem is that the existence not of foreknowledge but for truth. If it is true today that tomorrow I will uh, unfailingly sin, for example, or unfailingly buy a cheeseburger, <laughs> whatever it is, then it doesn't matter what the causal linkages of that are. The, the, the fact that the truth value exists today um, is what locks in, it locks in the future. It's the existence of that, of that truth value at that time. Um, and, and so I don't, I, I don't know that I agree with John that, that, that Molinism actually protects our libertarian freedom. I think it gives the illusion of doing so. Um, again, we're like the baby that is freely choosing all these left-hand turns, but the ultimate outcomes are based on which, which world God chooses to, to, um, to bring into reality. Now, I would also say um, regarding divine simplicity, um, Man, I find divine simplicity really difficult, and I know we haven't talked about this, and it's it's, but it's another part of the classical theist package, right? Divine simplicity, but boy, there's an awful lot of work on this being pushed back on too, particularly if you're a Christian who believes in the Trinity, um, right? Because um, it, just by definition, the Trinity is supposed to be distinctions between God in the in the relationships between the three persons. Um, now, a Unitarian Christian might not have trouble with that. He might say, well, you know, God's a, a single person and reject the Trinity. But I, I, I think divine simplicity is, is very difficult. And frankly, um, you know, the, the trying to make sense of natures and essences, um, that's not a thing that, that Christians uh, of, 
of the first century were worried about. That's a, that's a much later development in Christian history. Um, you know, the, the, the apostles weren't worried about, um, ab about these terms. In fact, they don't even really write in them. That's a much later thing when Greek philosophy gets brought to, to try and explain um, biblical teaching. So, um, so I don't know. I'm not, I'm not super excited. I'm not super focused on trying to make sense out of natures and essences um, from a biblical standpoint, because I think they can get us into trouble anyway. All right. That's a good answer. Interesting. Okay. Uh, from, from Shigu Alfie, a Muslim. A uh, problem with open theism is that phrase, there are things God does not know. Molinism is much better, but hard for it, many people to the hard for many people to get around to fully understand. I do think Molinism is misunderstood by a lot of people. I think that's true. Um, but I, I would I, I would question the question the the quote that there are things God does not know. I mean, we don't want God to know falsehoods. Like there are things we want God to not know, <laughs> like like what it's like to do evil or, or such. So um, that's why most open theists are very careful to just say God knows everything there is to know. Um, and just to point out that there are categories of things that uh, that other people would say are truth statements. They're 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 um, they're propositional truths that should have a, a, a true or false. And and open theists are just going to say no, it doesn't yet have a true or false. Uh, value whether Brandon's going to eat a cheeseburger tomorrow. Um, you know, it, it by valence doesn't apply to future contingences. And uh, well, that's one solution. There are actually quite a few. If if people get into it, there's a the Dale Tuggy that I refer to. He's got a, an article called Three Roads to Open Theism, taking different approaches to that. How you can can work through the ship of Theseus, not ship of Theseus. Um, goodness, now I've forgotten that. Um, it's a, the, the question about the, the future naval battle reference, <laughs> but there's this, there's this, and I don't remember if it goes back to Aristotle or where I can't remember off the top of my head, but, but this question, this statement, there will be a great sea battle tomorrow. And the question is, does that statement as of now have a true a truth value? Is it true or false now? And, um, and there's different ways to approach it. You could say, uh, you could say it does right now, but we just don't know it. And God, God does. You could say it does not yet have a truth value. Uh, you could say that here's the likelihood that it will happen. And there's, so there's different ways for philosophers of, you know, epistemological um, approaches to, to, to how God could know things. And, and it doesn't have to be that God's ignorant of stuff and he's stumbling around in the dark. Okay, cool. And I think that also dives with the ontology of truth, right? Let's say if God knows everything, then how and what kind of knowledge does he have? Does he know them like because they actually occurred in his mind and everything? Like, ooh. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, stuff gets super deep really fast. And and yeah, some of that gets really scary where, well, for me, for a Christian, it gets really scary because it starts sounding very, very unchristian, very fast, where, where, where sort of all of reality is like in God's mind alone or something. And, and um, yeah, that I want to stay away from that. <laughs> all right. And another question from Jefferson the Antipolo. Open theism, polemic alert, assumes that since God does not have any future, which I affirm as a classical theistic mon Molinist because God does not does know all facts sim simultaneously, so humans do not have to. The best implication for that is that humans and God must be in phase, in time, since humans are temporal. This means God experiences changes of knowledge and actual experiences. I believe God does not experience time, but only logical priorities. And the uh, two reacted here, me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that makes sense. I mean, on his view, um, if he d believes God does not experience time and only logical priorities, um, sure. That, that Molinism is, I, I don't know if Molinism is going to make him happy though. Um, because typically like William Lane Craig will argue that on his Molinism, that as soon as God creates, he's now in time. Um, that God before creation, and he won't say before, he'll say without creation, that God is timeless and with creation, God is in time. So um, I'm not sure how Molinus would, uh, I, I don't know how the breakdown on, on Molinus of which of them think that God is in time and, and which don't. But I would just point out that this, his comment that the best way to reconcile this uh, together 
I agree that the <clears throat> for God, pardon me, <clears throat> for God to experience changes of knowledge and actual experiences seems an awful lot like the the account we get in the Bible. Um, and um, I mean, this is what op open theists are going to say. Now, non-open theists are going to say, no, these are anthropomorphisms. These are these are where God is being described as if he is experiencing sequence and as if, um, you know, he comes to know that Abraham is, is going to be faithful and obey him. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's a simpler, uh, like I said, I think sometimes the simplicity of open theism actually freaks people out. They think God should be a little more mysterious than that. And and I think it's simple enough that God just comes to see what we do as we do it. Um, so yeah, there's this whole this whole dichotomy between the classical theism and open theism that I think is really it's it's that as much as it is between like Calvinism and open theism. Okay, so uh, thank you so much uh, for that um, awesome comment, Jefferson the Antipolo, and. Um, I, I, I can totally understand where you're coming from. That's why I made a love reaction. All right, man. All right. So uh, next question Next question is from Mark Colvin. Hey, bro, how are you doing? Okay. What about a modified open theism where God can choose to only know what he wants to? Does the attribute of omniscience necess necess necessitate God's bringing before his attention all noble things. I I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it's omniscience. Um, if you're choosing to not know things that you know, yeah, I don't. I don't know how to make sense of that. Um, there, the people will say this about um, about the incarnation too. That somehow the second person, uh, like, kind of had one arm tied behind his back. It's a terrible metaphor, but that he he restrained his omnipotence and omniscience during that period of time and i think you're either essentially omniscient or not um either you know everything there is to know or you don't and in god's case we have good reason to think that he does know everything there is to know because he's created a, um yeah i i don't know i i'm open to that to that idea but I'm more inclined. Uh, it's it's not a settled state of affairs yet, um, and so God knows it as as that as an unsettled state of affairs, and and when it becomes settled, He knows that too. Okay, well, I I hope that answers it, Mark, and <laughs> I think it defines it really comes down to how you define omniscience. If maybe if it works for your definition, sure, right? Uh, I can see you react here, uh, comment here, man. I'm gonna read it, okay. <laughs> And I'm going to react to it. Uh, so you said um, not a lot of support for open theism here. I see. Well, the will make the best case I can and see how people react. But I guess since none of you all are open theists, what's going to happen is already determined, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Then he says uh, determinism isn't the only other option to open theism. Lol. Open theism is literal heresy. You reply. Open theism is accepted by Protestants and Catholics alike. It's the absurd moral nihilism of Calvinism that ought to be rejected. Then we have a spectrum of options. Calvinism, Molinism, Arminianism, Open theism, don't we? My argument is that all the uh, first three fall into soteriological fatalism and undermine our moral agency. Hmm, can you explain this a bit more, man? Like, I, um, what do you mean by, uh, yes, and I think we can trace in, in Christian history when this view changed. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to read a little quote from a book called The Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism by Ken Wilson. He's a, he's a PhD, also happens to be a surgeon. Uh, he's got his PhD from Oxford, so he's, he's not a lightweight. Um, but he simply says, let me get the actual quote here, forgive me for taking a moment. Um, but he just says, Augustine changed the meaning of free will from a Christian one to a Stoic one. He just changed the definition of what free will was. And he did this based on his, back, now, just based on his background and these other positions external to Christianity. So I, I think in particular Protestants, I mean, um, 
in particular, Protestants need to take a really strong look at this view because um, unless you're Catholic, um, you you have a responsibility to go back to the sources, right? Ad fontes. And, and see if what Augustine says and what Calvin says is genuinely what was the the early that first century teaching of the of Jesus and his apostles. And when we know it's literal, I think what Gent said. Um, you know, heresy is a, is a the H word gets thrown out around a lot, but unless you have some kind of uh, authority from which to declare what is heresy, um, just disagreeing on a, on a theological position it doesn't doesn't qualify uh, me to call someone a heretic. You have to you have to be a bishop, or you have to have some kind of church structure which which officially labels things as heresy. So if a Catholic wants to come and and call me a heretic for something because I'm out of step with one of the church councils or something, that's fine. They can do that. But I think for us Protestants, we should be very careful with that. There were a lot, it was an awful lot of bloodshed during the Reformation when people started reading their Bibles and started saying, I don't think this is right. And, and people need to remember, there was the magisterial Reformation of Luther and Calvin, but simultaneously there was what's called sometimes the radical Reformation that um, holds all kinds of views, but including very open theisty <laughs> sounding views um, in, in the early Protestant uh, Reformation and, and has continued since. So, um, you know, I, I just, a word of caution to give people to challenge, uh, challenge the sort of classical theism view and to cla uh, challenge the five points of Calvinism. Okay, awesome, man. That I, uh, people could go back to the post if they want to see the, the whole interaction there. Okay, but I'm going to move into Matthew Ryan Brandon's comment. He says, no, Molinism is the most biblically encompassing view in my opinion. And three people react, including me. I'm not an open theist, man. So yes, I do agree with Molinism. So how would you react to this? Comment? Well, I agree with, with Matthew that we want the most biblically encompassing view. That's, that's the right way to go. And, and, um, you know, if we, if we come to different conclusions on that, I, I don't think that someone's salvation rides on this question. And I certainly wouldn't break off fellowship with somebody over this question. I think Christians of, of, um, uh, sincere hearts and and that are sincere truth seekers come down on different sides of this so i'm pretty careful in in judging people and uh and i agree with matthew's assumption we want we want the 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 view that explains the biblical data so to speak the best i completely agree okay thanks for that comment matthew and then mark Oliveira says open theism is closed I think closer to the I am of the Bible. I think he's talking about like the theology. Yeah, you know? I think he's saying the open, he's being clever. He says open theism is closed to the I am of the Bible. <laughs> I think he's saying that open theism turns us away from, from the I, you know, the, the, the God Yahweh of the Bible, right? He's, he's referencing that, that I am that I am thing. Yeah, no, no. He's, uh, and touche, Mark. Um, I, I, hopefully the, the discussion that we've had, um, will at least make my view, my reasons for it clear. And you may, you may still think that I'm turning my back on the God of the Bible, but that's certainly not my intent. I'm, I'm trying to take him seriously. And, and I have to admit, admit, like just on the surface, the God of the Bible comes to know things as they become real. He responds, he regrets things. I mean, he, he regretted the way the world was. And it there, those are very hard. I think passages, those and others are very hard passages to explain, um, from a deterministic standpoint, and they become very easy to explain from an open theist perspective. So, yeah, we'll all work yeah, through this together. Yeah, like, and Mark, after the if you after you listen to the video, you have to convert to open theism now. <laughs> all right. Okay, and then we're just joking. Okay, Ronald Jackson Boyd. Hey man, so how do you open the what? 
<laughs> I did, that's a funny comment. Okay, okay. Um, would you entertain that comment, man? Like, would, how sure. do you open theism? I mean, I maybe think is the, the method. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the way you open theism is by being in relationship with God. And now all of a sudden prayer is dynamic. God is listening to prayers. He is responding to them. Um, and he's not play acting as if, as if he is, right? Whenever uh, he has interactions with people in the Bible, he's not just playing his role. I mean, I've always wondered, you know, this, uh, that, you know, if God knows all of this a ahead of time, and I don't, I want to be careful. I don't want to, I don't want to straw man this, but you know, is God just going through the motions? Cause he knows he has to say this so that then Moses will say that. So that then God can say this so that then Moses can say that, um, and, you know, what's the point of, of an exercise like that? If, if, if I was going to write the entire script of a book, um, you know, once it's written, what's the point of actual, of actualizing it, right? Um, I think only on open theism is there something exciting and interesting happening. Look, it means our fates aren't settled yet. It means we have to respond every day in obedience and in discipleship to, to God and his Messiah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think most Christians live as open theists, um, honestly, right? Because they think that every day they're choosing and every day they're trying to obey and to sin less and um, even even the ones that think that God has you know unlocked their ability has has uh, changed their sin nature to allow them to 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 obey him, they still think they have to will to do that. So I, yeah, I, I do. I think open theism is is the easiest Christian to do, uh, easiest version of Christianity to do. Yeah. No, I, I I should be careful. Hopefully, people will understand. I am way more humble than this is sounding. <laughs> just, I'm just trying yeah, to answer, I, give my, give my you case. Know, you should write a book that titled like open theism opens theism. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you just titled it. Maybe you can write. That's a great title. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, thanks Ronald for that question. Uh, question. Uh, okay. My friend Ross, um, he's an atheist. He says uh, it's all absurdly idealistic. Yeah. Hmm, how would you respond? Yeah, to that? I I feel that. Um, you know, having gone through a, a long a period of of really questioning God's existence, um, I I still can relate to that idea. Like this is this is the best, most positive view, um, that I can come up with, right? Because God hasn't created anyone for the express purpose of demonstrating His wrath. Um, God hasn't before creation, like on Molinism, before creation, uh, chosen uh, a world in which you're doomed. On this view, God literally starts out with everyone having an opportunity, and he's actively working with everyone to try uh, to work them towards moral maturity and salvation. Um, and in some sense, the openness, the uncertainty is a beautiful thing. Because you can say, God, and this ties into theodicy, right? The problem of suffering um, that we could talk about sometime if you want to. But it, it allows God to say, look, it is my will that all should should be saved, right? And and that he is going to go after the the one the one sheep missing from the herd. Um I I so I guess Ross, I get it from an atheist standpoint. It I'm sure it sounds Pollyanna and and you know kind of silly and, and maybe overly optimistic. Um, but the flip side is maybe if, if, if we take Pascal's wager, you know, if it's right, man, there's an awful lot to benefit and think of all of the, the humanist values that we, that you, as an atheist, you, you would share with me as a, as a Christian and in particular as an open theist Christian that values everyone, um, doesn't think that anyone is a, is a vessel, uh, you know, set for destruction. Um, think about all we share and, and that this could give a context for that. And man, maybe you're not that far away, right? A few good arguments for theism get you to deism, um, you know, and, 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 you know, it's maybe not that far from this. And I, trust me, I understand the, for me, atheism is a, is like this pit of despair <laughs> um, at, at, at the ultimate end. And, and I respect atheists, that from sort of an existential standpoint will stand up and every day face the world and try and do good. Um, I just wish that they could share my grounding for that 
for that moral intuition they have. Yeah. And Ross, you know, he, he, I hope you're doing all right, man. You know, um, I, I heard you, you told me you got, you got into a rough time, but uh, I hope everything is well. And um, yeah, you man, that, that message there that might, you know, lead you to God. All right. <laughs> and then, okay. Uh, next question, uh, a comment. Hmm. Matt, not so far. So no matter how I try to understand open theism, I cannot understand it, so I reject it. Smiley face. Like they say, the future does not exist, so it is unknowable. Winky face. I really cannot understand how it does not exist. Yeah, so so his intuition is that the future does. It, this is what a I would call it a B theorist of time is going to say. And there's a lot in the world of science. In fact, your your interview with Jeffrey Kapersky was uh, was really excellent because in his book, The Physics of Theism, um, he talks about this, that in the world of, of uh, cosmology and in astronomy, um, in physics more broadly, there has been this inclination towards B theory, towards seeing space time as this unified, um, unified kind of thing. Um, and so time extends in, in, all, in both directions, past and future. Um, infinitely and it's just there like just a block right um, and for someone that looks at it that way yeah it's the the idea of presentism sounds really weird <laughs> but I, I would actually recommend um, Dr. Kapersky's book on this as and there's others too like th there's actually a growing I think wave of Christian philosophers um, that are that are presentists and that that argue that the the future is really it's really not real. And, you know, we all kind of have an intuition about this, right? Because um, whenever we have time travel movies where you go into the future, we're all like, man, that just doesn't wash. Like, <laughs> um, or at least it is that way for me. Um, and, you know, philosophically, it just, it creates all kinds of problems. If, if it's really there, it means, it means that, you know, if you're a Christian, Christ is eternally hanging on the cross that never ceases to be real. All of the sins of, of humanity, every evil that has ever occurred exists for all eternity in this block, as opposed to on presentism, it literally is in the past and a new world comes into being um, where that doesn't exist anymore. So I think a theory of time is just presupposed by every biblical author. Um, and I think B theory is, is a, a product of... Um, of non Hebraic thinking of, of, of Greek thinking. And, and I think as Christians, we should, we should challenge that. And, you know, there's lots and lots of material on it from Christian philosophers. If you want to read about the philosophy of time and, and yeah, that's going to be an underpinning for which of these views about God's knowledge you're going to, you're going to pick. And thank you so much, Matt, for that comment. Um, open, Kevin Vancewells, he says, open theists seem to think so. God only knows if it will catch on, catch on. Well, he, yeah. Okay. How about you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thanks for that, man. Uh, yeah, ne next, um, <laughs> Andrew Harlan Smith, he says, open theism is not equivalent to theism. Hmm. How would you react to that? Man? I, uh, I understand people will have strong reactions to this because they think it's, it's undermining God's sovereignty, but look, I use that term. I think God is sovereign. I just think that the way that he interacts, he restrains his power in some cases. Um, meaning he chooses carefully where to exercise his power. I mean, he doesn't show up on everybody's, you know, the foot of their bed every morning and say, okay, rise and shine, you know, keep my commandments. You know, he, he, he picks his spots. I mean, in all of human history, you know, if you look at biblical history, the number of people that he actually interacted with is actually a remarkably small number in human history. If, if you accept Christianity or, or Judaism. So, um, uh, my, my reason for bringing all that up is just to say, um, I, I think this open view is more plausible than some people realize because of, I think sometimes they have a caricature. And then I think other times people are afraid that it, it's making God small and weak. And I just think they might give open theists a chance to explain how we don't think God is small and weak. And, um, and how he's still great under that right. view. Awesome. Okay. I hope that answered the, the, that comment, Andrew. All right. Well, um, never mind this one. It's uh, about an, an angry theist, atheist uh, trying to refute me or something. <laughs> Anyways, uh, 
Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Ahmed Walan, he says, any theism is bad. Islam is the worst. Mm. Oh, yeah. I want to know your comment on Islam, man. So, um, so I, I'm not a student of Islam. Um, I, I only know of it, um, what I've studied in some comparative religion uh, material. Um, but I, most people that I meet that say they think theism is bad, um, they're describing all these negative outcomes of what I would, what most theists would say, well, look, that's, that's not my theism. Um, there's a quote from, I think it's uh, John Lennox, who's a uh, British or Scottish uh, Christian apologist. And he's a, also a <laughs> multi, multi PhD in mathematics and uh, in uh, the philosophy of, of science, who he says, uh, my God is not the God you don't believe in. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think that's the case, you know, my God is not the God you don't believe in sometimes where, um, you know, God has been used as an excuse for many, many horrible atrocities. And I understand why atheists push back on that. And I would just, I would just say, look, we don't, we don't want to judge a thing based on the worst of it. We want to judge it based on the, the best of it and whether it's true or not. So, um, so the question is, is it true? Um, and if it's true, then my guess is we're going to find it's it's not bad. If it's false, I think we're definitely going to find that it's it's bad. So I think it depends on the truth proposition of whether theism is true. Okay, uh, next, um, this is my friend, uh, Philip Williams. He says, open theism was borrowed from Ch Ch Charles Hartshorn's process philosophy. It's not the God of the Bible. Um, this is a criticism that is, um, it's good for people to be aware of. Um, it is indeed true that, as I understand it, that, uh, Richard Rice, one of the authors of the original, uh, book, the, the openness of, of God. And I think maybe Clark Pinnock too, uh, another one of the five authors, um, studied process philosophy and, and Charles Hartshorn's views. Um, but if you talk to most, um, most open theists, their views don't look anything like actual process theology. Um, at all. And it's worth noting the difference between process philosophy and process theology. Process philosophy goes back to like Hegel and, and some of these, uh, some of these, I guess they're 19th century philosophers. Um, and then there's sort of this process theology that comes out of it. And, um, and I just, I, I, I don't think that criticism lands because there were open theists before um, but, but, you know, it's not like open theism emerged in 1992. Um, it, it's existed before that. And frankly, I think if you do a study of the early, um, the, the early, uh, church fathers, you find them saying the same thing. And, and again, I go back to the history of, of looking at Augustine and his, his documented arguments. And, um, and it sounds like at his time, he was, he was the outlier, to, to hold to determinism, both the bondage of the will, like determinism means a lot of things. But I mean, one thing it means is, is that, that our wills are bound, right? That, that particular doctrine. And um, rejecting that, you know, that goes, that goes all the way back to, I would say, the New Testament and even before. So, um, so I, I hear Mr. Williams critique and people should be aware of that and, and I think protect themselves of it. Because look, the, the process theology, the God of process theology, isn't independent from the world he's he's wrapped up and i don't know how many people are familiar with it you just google it and find out but but um but no open theists are going to say that god created ex nihilo like he created the universe from nothing that god is has aseity um and that the universe is not and and these are all distinctions from from process theology so um so i hear what what he's saying but i i think I think that the the criticism doesn't have to land for all open theists. Awesome. Okay. And Lance Zimmerman says, what does that even mean? Well, bro, watch the video. <laughs> okay. Uh, James Rebel Jamias, he uh, uh, mentioned his friend Kyle Vollmer thinks so. And uh, Kyle Vollmer comments, I do think it is philosophically superior model. And a sad reaction from his friend James. <laughs> all right. Okay. And, um, well, P. Or Johannes von Ropenheim says, okay, now you have my attention. We'll watch tomorrow. Then I'll bestow the truth upon all who listen. Seriously, I'll watch. Okay, thank you for watching, man. Uh, Gantes Brasma, he says, I like clothes better. And um, I think that's the all the comments, bro. And, um, and okay, let's pause for a bit. And I, okay, one, two, three.
yeah and i think that's about it uh, hey guys thank you for the facebook comments and i'm really gl glad to do this kind of format where I, where I have an awesome guest you know answer all your questions you know i'm i have a lot of facebook posts you know and you, all of you put comment but i wish i could be like be a robot or, or a beast in, or something and answer all of them with all my heart and soul and mind but i can't <laughs> maybe this would be a good way to, to do that and um brandon thank you so much bro for coming on the on the show um that i think that was the best video anyone has ever made about open theism because i've never heard about open theism and i'll, I'll have to, i'll have to check it out on youtube and um and by the way, so Brandon, like, um, if someone is actually considering open theism, like, what would be you tell them, and how you know, like, what would be the path they should properly take in order to, in order to learn more about it? And um, yeah, and is there anything closing you want to say? Yeah, thanks. Well, first, thanks for having me on. I mean, I, like I said, I, I'm an amateur at this, and uh, I recognize that. So. Um, I can assure you there are far better descriptions of open theism out there and, and good debates. So people feel free to, to Google it. There is just a wealth of books. Um, one of my favorite authors on open theism is a, is a, a, a guy named a professor named William Hasker. So look up William Hasker. Um, you can go to the, the book that made waves in the early nineties called the openness of God. Um, co-authored by by five authors including some names we've already mentioned um and uh and just examine i i would say kind of sequentially what are your intuitions about time what are your intuitions about what it takes for us to have moral standing um do a little reading on augustine and calvin and some of the pushback on them um and then there are these great uh, search for, uh, you know, four views on uh, uh, divine sovereignty or four views on God's foreknowledge, things like that. And you can find these great books that in a few hundred pages gives you, you know, all four or five views that are, that are common on this. And you can come to your own conclusions. And, uh, you know, then we can all be amateurs arguing together <laughs> and hopefully in a, in a spirit of good natured, um, you know, a love for the truth and, and trying to, to seek it out. And, uh, look, I'm, I'm going to be back on the, the Facebook, uh, group or on the page commenting, feel free to, to throw the, the criticisms and I'll, I'll try and respond to them as I can. And, uh, and, um, the only other thing that I would say, I'm on, you can feel free to edit this out if you want, but, uh, I do have a blog, RG, um, where I post any of the stuff, um, uh, that I'm, talking about or, or thinking about and i'll look forward to putting uh this podcast on there and and thanks a lot elmo for having me i've i've had the best time talking about it all right man thank you so much so brandon um i love having you on the show maybe we could talk about the odyssey next time but uh for now uh god bless man uh have a great day so that's the end of it thanks for tuning in guys this is your host elmo Ador jr and Thank you for listening in and please subscribe. Please follow us on Facebook. Please, please follow this. Please. Thanks. It feels like we've waited 360 fixed times too for this year. Plenty of time to rethink your grand entrance. In you enter. They think you're going in for a bear hug. You run for it. Secretly slipping a holiday scratcher in both back pockets, boom! That entrance would be money, like top prizes ranging from $500 to $500,000. Play along with holiday scratchers from the Virginia Lottery at a retailer near you. For odds and more information, visit VALottery.com. It takes a lot of ingredients to fix or build a car, like cooking, but without the frozen dinner easy way out. eBay Motors has 122 million parts. It's always the right fitment, so you can follow any recipe to a T. Whether it's a vintage Italian coupe that's classic like grandma's meatballs or a German luxury car that's as complicated as Oma's Rouladen. To cook up something great in the garage, use the eBay Motors app or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride.